Hey, I'm Mark Lambert here with the National Barbecue and Grilling Association in the Sweet Swan of Mine Distributing Test Kitchen. We're here to show you a little something new today, how to make a little more money for your catering and special events by cooking a whole pig. We've got a whole 40 pound piglet here in front of us today and typically these are an expensive item on a buffet line or for a special event or party or wedding uh, that doesn't feed a lot of people. Uh, we want to show you how to change that today, we want to show you how to prep it, and we want to show you how to cook it to where it will feed a large number of people and be a nice centerpiece at your next uh, special event. For all you caterers out there, we want to show you how to prep this pig, how to transport it so that it can actually be a profitable item for you to sell uh, for your catering customer. It makes a really nice centerpiece as well as uh, feeding a decent amount of people when done in the fashion we're going to show you. So what we're going to do is, you, when, first of all, when you order this pig, uh, you have to order a certain way. And we order it as a rotisserie roaster. And if you order as a rotisserie roaster, they won't completely split the piglet from chin to buttocks. They will uh, just gut it just enough so they can get the entrails out of it. And it keeps it intact and it just makes for a better presentation. Um, so ask for a rotisserie cut roaster. Typically 50 pounds and under is what I like to do. It's very portable. It's a, a, it doesn't take up too much space on your buffet line or your centerpiece. Uh, it's just easy to handle and deal with. And most everyday 120 quart cooler will, will accept this both when it's cold and when it's finished. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna debone this piglet from the inside out. We're gonna leave all of the trotters and all of the shank bones intact. We're gonna leave the head completely intact and we're gonna completely remove the spine, the ribs, all of the shoulder, the blade bones, the femurs, the uh, pelvis, and everything from the inside. So we'll have a completely deboned piglet and then we're gonna show you how to butterfly and remove the bone out of a pork butt. And there's a, there's a seasoning method. Depending on what flavor you like or the theme of your party, uh, you can season it with Hawaiian or Cuban flavors. You can season it country style, which is what we're going to do, which is essentially a salt, pepper, garlic uh, seasoning base, and we're going to finish it rather than with barbecue sauce with a brown onion sauce. Uh, and we're going to make pull boy sandwiches. The other way, of course, you can put uh, barbecue rub all in it, and you'll have a lot of pulled pork to make traditional pulled pork barbecue sandwiches. So depending on what you like to do, you can sell it any way you want to sell it for you caterers out there. But we're going to show you how to prep it, how to debone it, and then how to finish the pork butts. And then we're going to show you how to sew it up to make it look nice and neat to make that perfect centerpiece for your next event. Okay, so this is the part you're going to have to take your time on, uh, depending on your level of knife skills. Um, we're just going to sort of take the truss off of it and remove this. Now, if you guys are local to the Memphis area, you can order this pig uh, this way from Fayette Packing Company. That's where this one came from. Um, if you've got a, a local supplier is the best way to do it. Um, don't freak out because when you order this pig, it will be a lot more expensive than a typical roaster you're going to buy to cook barbecue with. Um, the farmers, of course, when these pigs are this young, they, uh, they don't have a lot of weight to them and just a, a short period of time this pig you know, would have a carcass weight of 150 pounds, right now it's 40 pounds. So in a short period of time, a farmer can make a lot more money. So they make up for it with the price per pound. So don't freak out. This thing liable to cost you as much as four bucks a pound. So get ready. So what we're gonna do is we'll go ahead and, um, now you could have, we could have actually ordered this pig split, but you don't know exactly what they're gonna do to it. I'd, I'd rather do it on my own. So they could, you could order it with a split pelvis. Um, it may have made it a little bit easier. I don't think so in this case, um, but having the, uh, the, the sternum cut would probably be a little bit better. We're gonna have to cut it ourselves anyway, so we'll just go through here and cut the sternum. And what we're gonna do, is you can hear the bones popping, they're just, that's the rib bones popping away from the spine. So we're gonna take our knife and this is the kind of time that's best to use this boning technique and then we're gonna go in here, if you can see, and we're just gonna score the edge of where the ribs attach to the spine. 
and it's easier to go ahead and have access to this portion whenever you do that. And guys, I'm no expert at this. I've done it a couple of times, but it's been a long time, so bear with me if you see me maybe not doing something exactly to uh, USDA standards, or I don't really know what that is. So I'm just gonna tell you, we're gonna get this done. It may not be the most professional way you've ever seen it done. At the end of the, end of the day, we're showing you how to produce a pig that's gonna make you money in your next catering event. So you can start and separate these ribs anywhere you want. They're gonna to have to be cut loose here anyway at the edge of the belly. It's all gotta get separated so you can work your knife up around the ribs. And then when you get around the sternum, then you can go into the tips and you can separate the ribs from the belly. Just be careful not to cut all the way through. And then at this point, we're just gonna follow the ribs back being careful not to get into the shoulder. And this is something you just got to follow along, guys. We're just going to separate these ribs. And work our way around them a little at a time. Now, keep in mind, it's a young pig. It doesn't have a really thick belly. At the end of the day, you can't cut the skin. That's the whole thing here you have to be careful with. The rest of it, no big deal. You can, you can make all kinds of, of uh, clubs here. You can mess up any way you want except by cutting through the skin. And you can see I just folded the ribs over. And as I fold the ribs over, I'm following all the way up to the point of connection. And I'm going to come in here and separate them. you can see our little bitty rib cage come out nice there and I can go under each bone individually now and pull this out a little at a time again follow the bone see how I'm following the bone don't cut the skin I ain't gonna say I won't but you don't you shouldn't Just be careful. Don't worry about the meat. Most of your meat you're going to add to this situation here. You're just preparing this for a centerpiece. Okay, there's one side. So now we have access to the belly. We've got access to the loin on one side. So what we're going to do is we're going to come here on the other side. And we're going to pop that loose. All right, at this point we have the ribs removed from both sides. Uh, we are down to just a spinal column here. Uh, you know, a lot of times it's easier to start on one end or the other. Uh, it's been so long since I've done this, I can't remember which was my favorite start, way to start. So, at some point you're gonna have to disconnect the spinal column from up here. Um, and we are probably gonna have to get us a saw to do that. Can I do it with a knife? Yeah, probably. We can get right in between uh, a vertebrae and make that happen. And we're gonna work our way along and see. We'll make that decision here shortly. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna start along the side of the spine, and I'm gonna start removing loin from the spine. And I'm all the way up here to the edge of the shoulder. I'm gonna start removing meat from the spine all the way. And I'll expose the spine on both sides. Now the spine goes all the way to just underneath the skin on the back. So keep in mind, once you get down to the bottom, be very, very careful about removing the spine. And I'm gonna to wanna to disconnect it at some point and pull and work my way along. I don't wanna poke a hole if I can help it. Working my way around, you know, just feeling my way. 
feel them away. Once you get into some of these neck bones, it gets a little tricky. Work my way around these neck bones. Now, I've got my fingers all the way underneath the spine. If you can see there, you can see blue through there. I'm all the way through. Now, at this point, I'm gonna do my best to work the meat away a little at a time without cutting through the skin. That's our goal here, y'all. Remove everything, keeping skin intact for presentation. It's completely through. Now, once I get up to here, I'll eventually find me a spot to remove the column completely. And if I can break this without a saw, that's what I'll do. And if I can find a vertebrae to get this knife in between, that's what I'm gonna do. And all I'm gonna do is try to find a saw spot in the vertebrae and work my knife back and forth. And I believe I just found it. So insert the tip of your knife, find the leverage point, and go back and forth until you separate it. And you can see we've done it. Now it's connected just the base of the skull where we disconnected, right there. So, now it is just slow and tedious work of removing all of the spine without cutting through the skin. And the way that you do that the best way is to apply positive pressure the entire time. And you'll cut through just a tiny bit of cartilage when you do it. You'll know you're in the right spot. Positive pressure, work back, find your cartilage. Positive pressure, find your cartilage, a little at a time. Now, I don't know if you can see this, but there's definitely some cartilage left along through here, through the center. There's some cartilage left. If you don't leave cartilage, you're probably going to cut through the skin. So don't mind leaving just a little bit. Alright, we found a breaking point. That probably make pretty good soup. I ain't got it in me right now. This is going to require a little extra effort, y'all. And what I mean by that is getting underneath the skin and scoring the meat down to the femur, separating the femur from the shank uh, or from the, the leg bone, and working your way around the femur. We're just going to work our way through it a little at a time. We have a completely deboned center section at this point. That little bit of cartilage, don't worry about it. Unless you've got some big chunks, you can get in there with some snips and cut that out if you want. So we're gonna get in here and separate. Just gonna work our way around and we're working our way down to where you can see it. We're going to work our way down to a ball and socket joint that sits right there, y'all. That is a ball and socket that connects the pelvis to the leg. And so we're just going to separate the ligament at that ball and socket. And we'll be able to follow this femur all the way down to the knee. Same thing on this side. We're going to follow our way down until we hit the ball and socket. There's our ball and socket. And you may have to cut a little extra meat right around there to get to it, but it's right there. If you can see that. There's our ball and socket. There is a little ligament to disconnect that there. Just cut all the tissue away from it. I'm gonna split this just a little bit more, y'all. But as little as possible because I gotta sew that up later. 
All right, so now I'm going to pull the skin back away from this uh, from this ham. And I'm just going to pull the skin up, as you can see. Don't want to cut it. If I cut a little meat, I don't care. I don't want to cut skin. So what I'm going to do is expose this ham bone, or I'm sorry, this ham muscle, so that I can take this femur out. And it lays right here. There's the knee, and there's the socket. Cut right along until I can remove it. Again, the best way to do this, a little positive pressure. And I'm going to get my knife underneath the ball and socket. And I'm going to return just a little bit and follow the bottom side of that bone. And then I can lift this bone a little bit. As you can see, I'm going to work my way down to the joint. And then once I get to that joint, I should be able to should be able to pop it, but I may have to score it first. Yep. I'm gonna do a score it a little bit, and that joint should pop now. Yep. Just got a little bit too much connective tissue around it. And there's my femur. It's kind of small. All right. The only thing that's left now, really, is the leg bone and the shank bone. We're going to leave this this leg bone for structure. Okay. You could, you could go ahead and remove it down to the shanks, but it leaves a little more structure to the pig if you go ahead and leave it in. So the next thing that we can do here, we'll work our way around the pelvis and the back where the back side of the pelvis connects into the um, backbone. We'll work our way under. Guys, I hit a hard spot and I back up. I hit a hard spot and I back up. That's the way you're going to find it. Careful, don't cut yourself. We can get in here now and remove this guy. I can take it all the way down. And you're going to see there's a little bit of connective tissue right there. I'm going to go right down to the spine on both sides. And this is something you need to take your time on, y'all. I've only done it a handful of times, and it's been a long time. And I just picked my way through it. I want you guys to see that this is not hard. It is just tedious. And you don't have to be a professional to do it, because I'm far from it. So the pelvis... Again, positive pressure, a little at a time, hit the soft spots, if it's hard, back up a little, a little at a time. Trying not to, trying not to waste any meat if you can, but keep them, the most important thing here is that you don't compromise the skin. Once you do that, you lose your appearance. And that's why people pay big money for this, is because of appearance. All right. getting closer in here to the, where it connects to the tailbone again follow the hard bone little at a time taking your time get the meat away if you hit a hard spot back up here's the point to where you can see the tail here's the tail but I can start to see where the tail connects to the pelvis right here. So I know I'm in a good spot that I can separate the tail. I just got to find a soft spot in it to separate it. Because I don't want to cut my tail off. 
but I want to cut it down inside so I don't get skin with it. There's bone there. Follow it until you run out of bone. If you have to scrape it back a little, scrape it back a little. With a little practice, you can really do this in about 15 minutes or less. I've seen a guy do it in about eight, but he does them every day. I'm down to the point now to where I'm connected to the tail wagon part. So I'm gonna cut some cartilage. Backside right there. We've got a little bit of bone. There's my tail. I'm going to cut in between. And there's my entire pelvis of this piggy. There's my tail. I want to leave it. Okay? If you've got some extra cartilage, we'll get in here and clean this up. Not a problem. And there's some extra cartilage there. You got a pair of snips, scissors, kitchen shears. You can see the cartilage is the hardest stuff. I can feel it harder for you to tell where it is unless you're putting your hands on it but the way you know is it's contrast it's hard white against the soft flesh the, the, uh, the darker flesh so we got a femur bone left here guys what we're gonna do again we're gonna lift the skin we're gonna follow along you know what we need a little as good as a Gunter Wilhelm knife is it still needs to be sharpened every once in a while. This is hard on the knife. So, just work it back and forth and all we're doing is straightening our edge on our knife. Just much better. Same thing, be careful, don't cut through the skin. And all I'm doing is slowly exposing this knee. And come on, just like that. All that's left is our leg bone. There is no femur left. There is no pelvis left. There's only a small bit of tailbone. Everything has been removed. Now, because all this is going to get pulled, you don't want those big pieces of cartilage. That's just bad. Not going to break a tooth, but it's just not good eats. Feel around for pieces of bone, bone fragments, and uh, pieces of heavy cartilage. Okay, y'all here's where we're going to dive into the shoulders. And I got a little bit of bone right there. So we're going to go up underneath and hit our blade bone. And the blade bone is going to be right there. We're going to work our meat away from the blade bone. Now there's a little flap here where the loin turns into the shoulder you got this little flap, okay? And when you get to, when you pull that flap up, the blade bone is going to be right up underneath here. And when you get to the edge of the blade bone, you're going to see a little cartilage. And you should just be able to work your way right around it. And get your finger right up under the edge of it there, like such. And the blade bone has a little Y in it. It's got a little ridge in it. And I just got my finger under it so I can go and find what direction that ridge is running. I'm going to run my knife across the bottom. Separate the connective tissue from the bottom of that blade. There's a little fragment. Yeah, that blade bone's broke a little bit there. Thing later and roughed up a little, so be careful on those fra bone fragments and get those out as you go. So as you work your way down to the edge, and then you're going, to, your butt, you're not, you're not just going to make a little turn around that little ridge and that blade. Get your fingers out the way. Sometimes it's best to turn your knife around.
Here's where you want to be careful. The same way you wear everywhere else. Don't cut through the skin. You're going to work your way back to where this is connected. And this blade bone is broken on this one. So I should just be able to kind of almost pull it out. You should have to separate it from the arm bone. But as it comes out, you're going to see what it looks like. And if you ever cut a, cook the pork butt, then this is the blade bone out of the pork butt. And there she comes out right there. Make sure you're not cutting skin. Every time you cut anything, it's remotely close to it. It's all cartilage right there, y'all. So, there's that blade bone we were talking about, and there's that ridge. You can see it's got a ridge in it right there. And it's broken, the joint's broken. We're gonna have to take that joint out ourselves. So all we're gonna do is just work our way down to it. There's a bunch of bone fragments in there. Just make sure you can get those out. Don't be afraid to cut meat. Be afraid to cut skin. All of this meat has to be pulled away, separated from the skin in order to remove the bones from the meat. All we're doing is separating the skin and we're going to come down to this elbow, right here. So, little glands, you see that little gland right there? Take those out, those are probably just in about every pork shoulder, pork butt. You'll find, you'll find it once you get down close to it, it's a little gray fatty mass. Any of this little extra fat around that, pull it off. It's excess. I'm not going to worry too much about it. All this is going to be in the pig. No one's going to see it. Don't get caught up on it. I'm going to work my way around where that blade bone was connected. If you need to prop it up, hey, prop it up. Positive pressure. If you've got some positive pressure to help, help you along the way, utilize gravity, do it. That's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to work my way right around the edge of that bone. And I'm going to utilize a little gravity and a little pressure. To pull all this away. There we go. Got a little meat connected there. Cut it away. I'm down to bone, y'all. Look at that. Got some fragments. I'm going to come up and catch the rest of that. There we go. Now, now I can cut down to the bone confidently because I'm getting down where I can see it now. And if this looks mutilated, yeah, it kind of might be a little bit. I'm not told you, I'm not a professional butcher. But we're getting it done. Showing you how to make some money with a whole hog. Working our way down. All the way around, y'all. Follow the bone. Don't get the skin. Once you get down to where the skin is right up against the meat, you probably need to pull it back a little more. You don't want to cut it. Get in here just as far as you can where you can score that joint. Because that's where you're going to break it down. The joint should be in here. I'm going to score it a little bit until it gives away. A little bit of positive pressure. Turn it on this side. Score it away positive pressure, expose the joint, 
And there it is. I can see it now. See what I mean? Here's my joint. Take your time, guys. It'll come out slow, but sure. There we are. We got it all removed. You see a little gland tissue left in here? It's okay, it's just your sweet breads or your thymus gland. It's not gonna hurt a thing. If it's in your Find your joint. And it's always gonna be right behind that little elbow, y'all. Pull your uh, arm bone out. Go back, find your uh, excessive pieces of connective tissue, cartilage, where you removed joints and bone. Part of that's right there. All this is down inside, connected to the arm. Look at that, y'all. I think we have a successfully deboned tick. So look here, guys. We've got bones in here in the head. You've got bones in the arms. You've got bones in the lower legs. Lower legs all the way around. So, we have a little roaster ready to stuff. So what we're going to do, we're going to show you how to debone the pork butt. Then we're going to pull all of this together. We're going to set all of this up. Just like that. Then we're going to turn it around in a beautiful little crawling roasting position. And we're going to cook this dude. And we're figuring somewhere in the neighborhood of under six hours at 300 degrees to get all this meat in the center. Nice and done with a beautiful country style flavor. So we're going to set this in the cooler just to minimize the fly intake. And we're going to pull out a couple of pork butts. And I think it might take three pork butts to stuff this guy. We figure three quarters of here, three quarters here, and maybe a little over one here. So maybe three pork butts, maybe a little less. We'll see how much we can stuff in there. We want her nice and fat for a pretty centerpiece. So we're going to uh, get this one off the table, get a few pork butts. Then we'll uh, give this a little time to cool back down, kind of hot outside. And we'll reset and restart. Pork butts. Simple. These are kind of small pork butts. As you can see, we have a blade bone here. This is the exposed cut blade bone. And then uh, this is cut off to the point that you can't even see the other side of it. Yeah, there it is. It's, it's just mostly cut in half. That's why it's such a small butt. So, you can see the blade bone. It's sitting to where the point is down. And so I'm just going to start here and I'm going to work straight across the flat side of this blade bone. And it's small. It's cut in half, actually. And then there's the back side of that blade. And so I can go straight down there. And I can make the turn. Put my knife under here. Go around the little whoop de doo And the D-bone pork butt, you can see it's a blade bone, but it's cut in half. So all we're doing is we're going to butterfly this pork butt. Essentially, we've just cut its thickness in half, y'all. That's what we did. Remove the bone, cut the thickness in half. So now I've got two halves. The way I like to do this, now I'm going to go in half again. I don't have a cutting board down here, so that's why I'm not cutting down, y'all. And my beautiful Gunter Wilhelm knife on the granite. No bueno. So then I'm going to go cut cut these into good even sized pieces, y'all. Six or eight pieces, whatever works for you. All you want is just kind of they're somewhat even in size. Some pieces are a little thicker than others. Try to get them somewhat even in size so they cook evenly. Same thing over here. I'm going to cut this in half. I say a cut in eighths is usually about how I do it. Hair more depending on whether it's the thick or the thin end of the butt. It's not this part again, it's not rocket science. That's the thin end, you don't have to cut that at all. One more time. So, there we are. 
Now then, the question is, is that enough to stuff my pig? I don't think it's quite enough. I'm going to need a little bit more. Guys, this is country style to me. Uh, one of the most country fellas I know is Joey Smith in Texas Chrome. He's got a GPS, or garlic, pepper, salt seasoning. That's uh, my favorite thing to put on country style pork butt. So that's what we're going to put on this piggy. We're going to put a little inside. If you hear a little noise in the background, that's a fan because it's hot up in here in July in Bahia, Mississippi. We're going to put a little there, but we're going to go through here, y'all. We're going to season our pork butts, and our pork butts are going to start to go in a little at a time. We're going to season them as we put them in. I'm pretty sure we're going to wind up using all this. We're going to take a little more here. This is some good seasoning, y'all. Garlic, pepper, and salt. It's all you really need. My favorite pork butt country style is cooked with this seasoning. We're going to get an idea. I think it's going to be about right, y'all. This is three you know, somewhat small pork butts. And this is a uh, part you got to use at your discretion, you know. Oh, yeah, look at that, y'all. This is what we're going to put together. It's going to come together nice. That's three small butts. 40 pound pig, y'all. If you're going 40 or 50 pounds, you may want to go a little more. But I think that's going to be a nice little fatty piggy there. So what we're going to do, y'all, we're going to back up real quick. And I'm going to get my needle, my trussing needle, along with my butcher's twine. We're going to get it sewed up and we're going to get this little piggy uh, back into the cooler overnight. Then we're going to cook it tomorrow. We're going to try to find the smallest cooker we can. And it wound up maybe being a pellet cooker. We're over there, uh, Danny's over there measuring by hand to see if this will fit on the Yoder 640. And it would be really cool if it did. Okay guys, we have threaded our needle. This is a, um, a trussing needle. They make a larding needle, but this is a trussing needle. Uh, it's got a large eye in it. This is just some standard butcher's twine. You can see we've run uh, a length of butcher's twine through here and we just tied it at the end. And we ran it through one time with a knot just so it wouldn't pull through. Um, on your first go round, you know, double your knot up. Make sure you got a big enough knot. You don't want to pull it through. You want a nice big knot because that's your first anchor points and that's what you're doing is you're pulling this back together. And if you have to start over on this again and get another length of twine, hey, no big deal. We're going to start there and as we work our way along, make sure you catch a length of skin. Don't get just fat, but come through it and start to lace it up just like a, pair, a good pair of tennis shoes. Catch a length of skin and back through. Utilize your belly if you got one there. Hold it tight. Keep on lacing up. Just like a rebox, y'all. Don't poke yourself. See how I'm going through there? Again, just like pulling the bones out of this little fella, take your time. You don't want to poke yourself with this. You want to make sure that it stays intact while it cooks. Nice, even laces coming around. Make sure that you're going nice and straight and it's coming together the way you want it. You want the belly nice and full, y'all. You don't want it looking malnourished on the centerpiece of your event. Alright, and as you uh, make it to the end, make sure you make yourself a return, catch the top, and start working your way back and just tie in your knots. Just go in, in between, in between here. And all I'm doing is just making it sure that, uh, getting a good anchor point to make sure that my my knot didn't come undone. And I'm going to come back. I don't want my laces to get loose. And I don't want them to come undone. 
and I'm going to find me a point that I can tie this off. So I'm going to do a couple of good overhand knots, tie that off. And now, this little piggy is about ready to go. Now then, what you have here is a little centerpiece piggy. Gonna go on the pit just like this with his little legs all happy up under. Just like that. And she's gonna roast. Just like that. So it'll make a real pretty centerpiece. And once this is done, y'all. We're going to tuck those up under there. When we get done with this, all we're going to have to do is just cut the top of this out. And we got a pretty roasted pig centerpiece to serve your guests with. So, until tomorrow, we're done here at the Sweet Spot of Mine Distributing Headquarters. Um, here on behalf of the National Barbecue and Grilling Association, showing you how to put together a little roast piggy feed a crowd. Thank you all for watching. Join the National Barbecue and Grilling Association. Come be a part of our conference, be a part of the family, and learn a lot more stuff just like this to further your business and make more money and make fewer mistakes. Peace out. God bless you. Got the pig on the smoker. Yeah, this is a CTO and it's a little small cooker, not designed for cooking whole pigs, but you know what? It works perfect for this pig. Whatever size cooker you got, this, this pig will even fit on a Yoder 640 pellet cooker. Give you an idea of the space needed to cook it. Uh, we're just putting it on here because it's a convection pit, it's convenient. Uh, they're one of our sponsors and Old Hickory Pits cooks a great pig. Um, I, sp <laughs> I spared you the details of the pig wrestling event and getting this on here. It wasn't too bad. Um, it is manageable at the size, but what we're gonna do now is we've got him uh, positioned and maybe we wanna, maybe wanna move him back just a touch. Pull his tail back so it doesn't burn. We're going to take his feet. You can tell the feet are positioned up under him to stabilize on both sides. And when we put him back in there, we'll cross his front feet to make sure to keep his head elevated. Uh, the feet also will help prop up the center to make him look more natural. Uh, and we're going to position them corner to corner. They're about 26 and 3 quarter, about 27, 28 and 3 quarter deep. So it fits pretty good corner to corner. We've got him positioned with the hams right back there. We may rotate him as he firms up, but right now we're, what we're gonna do is we're gonna go in with a couple of sheets of aluminum foil. And this is just for appearance, y'all. We're gonna double them up. This is heavy duty uh, Reynolds Pitmaster's Choice just because it's really stiff. And then we'll go in here behind these ears. And let's just start on the inside and we can wrap well, we'll start around here. It works perfect. And we're going to overlap, being careful not to bend the ear because it's real flexible right now. And wrap that. We want that foil nice and firm. And we'll come back around to give a little stiffness to it to make sure and wrap around that this ear stays nice and direct during the cooking process. We'll do the same thing on the other one. And this is just to make him look nice and natural when he's on the line, on the buffet line, everybody's taking pictures of him. We'll do the same thing here. We want to position it so that it keeps the ears stiff and up. And we want to make sure that we get all of it. This is a, kind of a floppier piggy here, kind of a big one. So let's open our foil up a little more so we cover the entire ear. We'll wrap around and we're going to flatten it out. Now we can come back down to the tip and then fold it back over that way. And then again, we're going to try to, not trying to look like some Dumbo ears here, but we do want to uh, redo this one. They're going to shrink inside there, but that's okay. They're going to stand up and look natural. And that's what we want. Now at this point, 
We can go in here and give them across the legs a little bit just to make the head stand up. Nice and relaxed and natural looking. Look at that. Striking a pose. If we can get him back in there where it looks like that, let's push. And that's how I want it to cook. How about that? That's a happy looking piggy. So, first and foremost, when you get ready to put the pig on, I like to take it out about an hour early, let the let it slowly come up a little bit so it's not super cold right out of the cooler. Uh, next thing is you want to dry it off, the exterior of the skin dry it off. We're going to leave it in here a little bit to dry a little more before we uh, apply any oil to the outside. We want it nice and mahogany and golden. Uh, it's probably going to take about seven, uh, around seven hours to complete this at about 300 degrees. Uh, we're looking for internal temperatures in here in the pork butt. You know, we're looking for something that we can pull the meat. We want 195, somewhere in there. Um, should be a nice pig. So we're, we can't wait. Hope you guys try this and use this as an opportunity to gain more uh, special events and uh, add a little bit of extra value and bottom line to your uh, catering events for a nice centerpiece. So hope this works out well for you. We're going to close the Old Hickory CTO up, turn it on, and uh, whoosh, get close right there. The door's going to get right on it. Let's see how it does. Hey, we're back here at the test kitchen and our pig is done. A little stuffed 40 pound piglet. This is perfect for your catering operation. This will feed a whole lot more people than it would prior to the stuffing. So if you want to change this up, feel free. Well, all you're going to do is when you season your pork butt, season it with a traditional barbecue rub if you want traditional barbecue flavors. And when you serve it, serve it with coleslaw and serve it with barbecue sauce. Um, if you want to do it Hawaiian style, season your pork butts essentially with salt, pepper, garlic, the same thing and then maybe a little bit of pineapple juice, uh, some citrus to go along with it, a little zest, uh, lemon or orange zest or grapefruit zest. Those things help go a long way to enhance the flavor of it. A little lime, a little lemon, typically uh, a little something to offset the sweet of the pineapple, a little bit of sour to go with it. It's usually a little lime and a lemon. Very few herbs, keep it simple, sweet and sour if you're wanting to go Hawaiian. And then your traditional uh, uh, Hawaiian sauce that we'll make to go with it will be uh, brown sugar, soy sauce, uh, uh, pepper, garlic, and a little bit of ginger. Makes it a really, really good finishing sauce for your um, for your Hawaiian style. Oh, look at there. Our phone, which we're running a Tappy Q Wi-Fi on there, is telling us our pig is done. So it was done a little bit ago. We actually, you can tell, keep my arm on the rack, that it was done a little while ago and we let it sit here and rest so that that meat in there is not so hot. As you guys know, you always want to let your uh, your port rest after it's done. Uh, and we're going to take this over to the table and we're going to dig into it. We're going to toast some French bread and we're going to make us a piggy po' boy. All right, we got the pig all ready. This is kind of how we like to present it on the buffet line uh, as a centerpiece or as an edible entree. Uh, you can put any type of herbs, fruit, whatever your, uh, I'm going to say whatever your theme is, garnish with that. So if it's Hawaiian, use pineapples, banana leaves, that kind of thing. If it's country style, you may want to use some turnip greens. You may want to use some cornbread muffins. You may want to use some dinner rolls, whatever you want to do with it. Um, we put a little bit of sage and thyme in our gravy, uh, and we've got lots of fresh herbs, so we just garnished it with a little bit of herb. And we've got it set already with our knife ready to carve. And we went ahead and toasted, as you can see there, a nice French roll. We carved a little bit of the excess bread out of the center. But typically the way we like to serve this, um, we like to have a little presentation. It's not always necessary. Sometimes we just drop this off. But typically, we just take our knife and we go right down the back and we cut us a square out of it. And at this point, you can peel it back and expose all of that wonderful roasted pork on the inside and you've got a nice serving vessel right here and so look at all of our pulled pork we cooked the internal temperature of this this these pork butts were right at 200 degrees and so we've got loin mixed in here we've got shoulder meat from the pig we've got this beautiful collar meat 
right up in here behind the head of this pig and we can mix all of this up and we're gonna get the gravy and we'll show you how to finish it this is the point we ran out of space on our camera card but you can see we we're applying the gravy and pulling the meat you can see some of the finished meat with the uh, the gravy mixed in and then once that comes through we've actually got a finished picture we're lucky we had pictures of the finished product as well technical difficulties and we're going to take this roll we're going to invert it this right here to me is a very critical part of the process and it involves wrapping so i'm going to wrap it And the reason this happens is this just makes it all come together, okay? If you just went ahead and served it right now, it would be good. But at the end of the day, when it wraps up and that gravy infuses with this bread just a little bit, it makes it ten times better. And then if you double wrap this thing across there, you can take your serrated knife and you can go ahead and cut your slices. And this paper acts as a really nice barrier uh, on your line so that you can handle it and also as something for the, uh, for the guests to keep the sandwich all together with. All right, the finished product is right here. Uh, you can do this on individual rolls, on small slider buns. Um, whatever's the easiest way for you to keep track of your serving sizes, uh, that's imperative. Th we're not worried about serving sizes here. We're about, worried about a piggy po' boy and just eating it. So we've got these l extra large French rolls we got at the Piggly Wiggly. And we've got, had them sitting here about five minutes now and it should all be steamed and warm and come together. Toasting these buns, to me, makes a huge difference because you've got a really juicy product in there and it really helps it hold up and it adds to the flavor. So, all we're going to do now is we're going to start slicing this dude up. I'm going to start at the end here and I'm going to cut off some sections because we got some friends in the background that are ready to eat. And so now, you got to make sure you go with it. What we have here is a piggy po' boy. Now, if you're like me, you're going to pull a side of gravy and you're going to dip that, and it's just going to be absolutely wonderful. So, stuffed piggy, catering, if you can't do it by now, all you got to do is call me. Go to the National Barbecue Association members page. If you're a member, all you got to do is click on my link, and we can communicate by email. You can call me, do whatever you want. Join the National Barbecue and Grilling Association to learn all kinds of stuff just like this to help you make fewer mistakes and make more money. Peace out. God bless you. Thanks for watching.